Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this week we've got Marianne Brown from James Cook University. Marianne has, wears many hats and in fact has, has done the whole suite of Anne's projects. She's, she's done several app, apps projects, she's done uh, a Seeking the Commons project, a data capture uh, and now metadata stores. Um, so that's why she's such a remarkable woman, but she's covered them all. <laughs> anyway, without uh, wasting more time, I'll hand over to Marianne, uh, who's going to talk, uh, I hope, about two things. One is about the research uh, portfolio and also about the infrastructure she's built for self-deposit at JCU. And I know there's considerable interest in the notion of self-deposit and what that entails. Okay, Marianne, over to you. And we'll thank you, Marianne, for, for agreeing to do this. Thank you, Simon. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, this is a um, bit of a rehash of the talk I gave at the community Redbox Community Day at Adelaide. So for those of you that were there, I hope it doesn't get too repetitive for you, but here we go. Um, so at JCU we've been doing ANS projects um, for a little while now. Uh, we started off with a very small apps project where we built a prototype metadata repository. It was really just a toy system. Uh, we had the idea that we wanted to do self-deposition and we wanted to have a um, uh, small something that we could play with and, uh, and see how that would work. Um, then as we went on we took on a couple of bigger app projects and we now have a data capture project that should be coming online shortly as well which um, have been and will be producing lots of data sets. So our Edgar project uh, which was APO3 uh, on our first ingest uh, we imported uh, 1498 records from that. Uh, it's uh, all those records are in now, which was a, a big task and caused lots of stress, but um, it was it was all good. Um, as the Edgar project continues, the new data sets that get generated from it will be less, but it was just that initial bulk import which was uh, presented some challenge. And we have another apps project, um, Climaz, which APO2, which um, will again stretch our metadata system, uh, when we do an import from it, its initial import is around the two and a half thousand mark. So that will be interesting and should be happening in the next few weeks. Um, so to, to background to our system, we in the we started off with a little small system and then as these projects was, well, went on, decided we needed a more re robust production ready uh, metadata repository to cope with what we were trying to do. Um, also, uh, main consideration was our library re resources are scarce and I don't think that's unusual for any Australian university. Um, and uh, the library's wish was to keep workload Im impacts to a minimum. So while we'd, uh, we'd uh, looked around and saw what other people were doing and saw that Newcastle were doing some wonderful work. Um, but their chosen methodology of doing the uh, interviews was something that our library just uh, felt that they wouldn't be able to um, to to do to to get not to the level where we were hope for the amount of data sets that we were hoping to to get into the system. Um, so that was our main starting point. So our main mechanisms needed to be self-deposition by researchers for their individual data sets and then we needed to have a machine deposition capability for large-scale collections. And um, So one of the properties of those large-scale collections is that basically the metadata is all quite sim similar. They've been all generated with the same algorithms or the same methodologies um, and they're uh, the differences between one metadata record and another are, are down to a few key fields and the bulk of the metadata is uh, pretty much the same. So we felt that that lent itself to, to automation. Okay, but the main thing we wanted to do was get the self-deposition working and so our main question was how do we motivate researchers to add their own, add their own data sets to, this, to the system. Um, and I don't know, um, my experience with, with academics is that sticks 
tend to turn them into mules and donkeys and they won't do what you want them to do. So your best approach is, um, is always with carrots and to encourage and, and try and uh, offer them a benefit to, uh, to doing what it is you want them to do. So um, our main, um, main carrots, um, external, external forces add carrots, says um, uh, ARC and NHMRC granting bodies that are encouraging people to put things into data sets as you know, asking in their applications for data management plans and all that sort of things. Certainly has got um, some of our early our earliest people to uh, do self-deposition -de were people filling in those grant applications and wanting easy um, solutions to fit those requirements. But that's only a few people at our university and we wanted something that would get um, the bulk of, um, of our researchers on board. So the Mendes Data Stores project provided us with the perfect opportunity for that because one of their optional deliverables was uh, the research portfolio or the research profile pages. So over the last <coughs> six months I'd say here at eResearch JCU we've been building our research portfolio system uh, which we'd like to show today. Um, this has been an in-house cu custom build, it's not a commercial bit of software. We have um, a collection, our, our sources of truth, some are third-party commercial products and some are in-house built databases. So um, uh, we've, we wrote our own system that would um, extract our, our information from our sources of truth and present them in an attractive manner. Um, so this is our front page. Um, if you update your profile regularly, then you get to stay on the front page. So that's motivation for making sure things stay up to date. Um, an example page, let me see, let's, I'll pick my boss, do Ian's page. Um, on this page, most of the information is um, pulled out of uh, internal sources of truth. So the amount of information that a researcher has to add to make this more attractive is quite minimal. Uh, we don't store biographies, so a the biography here and this about section is something that a researcher would have to provide themselves. But the majority of the contact information is scraped from internal systems. Uh, this little word cloud here about their research uh, areas is built from um, their publications and their grant applications that are in our systems looking for keywords that are used, um, come up most often. Again, uh, the FORs and the SEO codes, again, picking those top three that show up over again and again in their publications and stuff. Publications tab, uh, this is pulled from our um, publications repository. It shows um, uh, the most recent, so in the last seven years, but there is a link through to um, the full profile if you want to see the full list of um, any researchers publication history you can but other than that you will just see the most current so you'll see what they're currently working on. Uh, funding from our um, research services um, database, supervision uh, information comes from our student systems, um, privacy concerns um, so that so we can't don't show students names at all um, though some some people really want their PhD students names to appear they they don't we just give the name of the um, the project and uh, the the researchers role either as a principal supervisor or an associate or an associate supervisor uh, we show um, current and those that have completed within the last five years and for those that have completed in the last five years if the thesis is in the repository then that link will take you through to that uh, repository. And then one nice feature, um, this again is built from information that exists in, our, in, the, in the publications repository, it's just showing you the places that this researcher um, collaborates with around the world. So they can go through and see. If the person has data sets, so if I go back to portfolio page, if the person has data sets in our metadata repository, then there also is a 
<coughs> a data tab will show up. Now, Jeremy hasn't ed edited his um, profile at all. Um, we put the very bad picture in for him. We've got to get another picture of him. But you can see even without um, the academic going to any amount of trouble, you'll notice there's no biography there, um, it still is a fairly complete uh, profile without the researcher having to do anything. And it's attractive and, and looks nice. So adding additional stuff then just completes the picture. So what we're sh showing to the researchers that is if they do their bit in letting the university know about their publications, make sure that their grants go through proper channels and recorded um, and, and put their data sets in the data repository, then without any other effort on their behalf, they will have a complete and up-to-date and attractive looking profile page which that they can then um, used to advertise themselves. So that's our main carrot. Um, that has gone over um, really well. Um, it's going live internally uh, next week and just to give people a chance to check their information. As we all know, corporate systems don't, aren't, uh, internal sources of truth sometimes contain small lies. Um, and it's nice to be able to see those lines and get them get them fixed. Um, so uh, there'll be about a two-month period where uh, everyone will have a chance to go through and inspect their pages. Um, if they see places which aren't correct, for example, they're down to teach subjects that they're actually not teaching or they're not showing up as teaching subjects that they are, then the site, when you go into edit mode, um, will provide you with information as to how you go about correcting that information that is coming from those external um, sources of truth. Um, the uh, deputy, uh, senior deputy vice chancellor took one look at the profile pages and said there's no really any need for um, applications for promotions now. You just send us a link to your page and we'll decide whether you need a promotion or not. So, <laughs> I, I just so more carrots. <laughs> Um, so having got our carrots now in place, um, we're working on our self-deposition. Uh, we have our prototype site. We built that back at the start of 2011 as our first project. Um, and we're going to use that interface as a starting point for our prototype for our um, self, uh, self deposition plugin for Redbox. Uh, the, the, so uh, uh, the way we want it to work in Redbox is that the researcher will be able to log in and uh, create a metadata record. That record will remain private to that individual researcher until such time as they believe it's ready and they submit it, in which case it will switch over into the normal um, library review workflow. Uh, the, we are giving the, the research the ability to share view access to the record with co colleagues. Uh, one of the key um, deposition mechanisms that we observed in our prototype site is that the professor who has 20 or 30 data sets to put in uh, the repository doesn't put them in themselves. They find a PhD student or a research assistant or they apply for a grant and get money to pay for someone to do that for them. Um, that's fine as long as it's not um, our library staff being asked to do it. We don't care how the stuff gets in there. Um, but what it does mean is that typically the professor or the the researcher who's getting someone else to do that deposition for them does want to check what's going in before it uh, or before it goes public. So in the case where we have someone other than the key researcher doing the data access, that person can then share view access of that record with with whoever, so that things can be checked. Um, Redbox unfortunately doesn't implement any low down locking, so giving more than one person right access to a file is problematic. So the way we will overcome that is that while only the owner of the record can edit the metadata, that owner can transfer ownership if they choose. So in the case where we have a PhD student entering the metadata, they can create the 50, 10, 50 records, whatever it is, um, get it to a certain standard and then 
um, transfer the ownership to the professor to do the last um, spit and polish before it uh, then gets handed over to the librarians for checking and, um, and making sure everything is as it should be. Um, Yes, yeah, so once the record's been uh, submitted in for review, it then leaves, leaves the researcher's control and enters the normal workflow. So if the researcher has seen something that they want changed after that point, then it'll be normal channels as what would happen now. They would need to contact uh, the, the reviewers in the library um, and um, point out what needs to be changed or modified um, uh, to, to get that that fixed. Um, for us, we, we've researchers care about their data and they're usually fairly good at doing most of the metadata. Uh, so we will be uh, when our work, the position in the existing workflow that we will be putting our self deposition records will be in the final review stage of that workflow. However, um, if anyone chooses to use that plugin, that would just be a matter of um, making a few simple changes if you would rather that it um, landed in investigation um, as, um, as uh, accepted alert alerts normally would be so that it goes through the full chain of review that you've got at your institution. Um, Mary Ann, can I just ask you there, just to clarify something? Yep. Um, it's Simon here. Um, so the workflows built into Redbox for that review, did you have to tweak them or did they work perfectly for you? Um, okay, so currently the Redbox team have been working on the data management planning tool for Flinders and South Australia. Uh, Flinders, Deakin and Newcastle I think are all involved in that project. And so they've already created a, this this workflow, um, a similar workflow. So we're piggybacking off that work. We don't want to do anything new. Um, um, no point having two competing um, uh, uh, workflow streams there. So we've we've got the code off Andrew, and uh, then we're just adapting that to to suit us. And pretty much. That workflow is the same one as the data management planning tool. Uh, the ultimate vision for between me and Duncan is that um, I don't know if you've all seen Duncan's plan of a, um, a dashboard for a researcher. So a researcher will come in and see what uh, data management planning um, uh, plans that they've uh, they've started working on, and they would also see if the self deposition has is a plugin that you've installed or turned on. Uh, you would also see your records that you've created yourself. Um, and the the one thing we need to work on with Duncan is uh, what we want to be able to do is take a data management plan plan and um, import information from it into that self deposition uh, metadata record. So try and make those two, which at the moment two different products, but work nicely together in the same sandbox. So if you turn on both self deposition and the data management planning tool, you'd have your researchers start off with their data management plan when they're happy with their plan and as data sets started to uh, eventuate out of that project that that plan was uh, for, uh, they would uh, click a button that says create a data set from this plan. It would pre-fill um, information out of, from that plan into the self-deposition, things like who are the people involved, probably the description, some of the um, uh, FOR codes or other information that you might have in your data management plan would come across. But then they could be edited in that um, self-deposition. Obviously a generic description that you've written for your entire project in your data management plan uh, would need to be uh, adapted or amended or added to to be an accurate description for an individual um, data set that is coming out of that plan. And then um, and then once you're happy from there, then it would switch over into the normal workflow. Um, Diane Hillier has a question which you may want to ask or answer later because it, it's, uh, I know a lot of people have this question. 
and it's how you went about or how, how you get, what carrots you use for researchers to create good metadata records. Is that something you'd like to talk about now or later? Um, yeah, I was, I'll switch over and I'll show you uh, in our metadata repository. I was just going to, first of all, just do a quick show of what our, our prototype system looks like. And note this was built in, a, is a different system from Redbox. And so what will be in Redbox won't be exactly this, but just to give you an idea of what we, um, uh, sort of planning of showing uh, for self-deposition. Um, we've modified our red box so that you can have more than one, just one description field. What we've found is that researchers really want to give detailed descriptions about their metadata. They care deeply about their methodology and have a, a, want to have an opportunity to explain that, to explain any quality assurance mechanisms that they've put their data through. Um, and so left to themselves, a researcher well, it does depend on your researcher, I will qualify that, but some researchers, when you give them a description, will start writing like they're writing a technical paper and it can go on for pages. So we, so we give them the ability to create um, as many descriptions as they want to. Uh, we generally encourage three, so brief is for your layman's description for someone who's not necessarily in your field. Full description, go for your life. What do you think another researcher in your field who wants to use this data set would want to know about it? And then a notes field saying, okay, now give us a bit more of the information about the technical side of the of the data set in terms of, you know, what formats it's stored in, you know, if it's a spreadsheet with lots of columns and you've used abbreviations, give us give us some hints here. <laughs> um, preferably you don't use you know, you'd include a legend in your spreadsheet, but there may be additional information you want to put down here. Um, coverage, standard stuff, a map to draw on. Um, data location, um, is it in a lab, is it in a, a, a room, is it sitting on a computer system somewhere? Um, that is more for us just to gather where it is. Often researchers have large amounts of data which are quite tricky to transfer between systems if you're talking to someone who's got a hundred, you know, 10 gig files that they want to transfer, um, yeah, maybe sticking it on a USB key is problematic um, and, and walking it over to someone's office. Not everyone's up to um, uh, doing um, the transfers on the computer. Um, associations as we all, all know and love, keywords, and then extra information, um, space for writing legal stuff, um, and this is and and choosing licenses. This is also uh, sort of a bit of an alert to us as to whether we need to go and talk to um, legals or ethics and make sure we've got all the appropriate clearances on stuff, and how um, whether what the legal collections, the legal rights. Um, uh, saying and what the researchers put down is how they want to share this data is actually compatible and stuff. Okay, so that's that's what the um, that's what that interface looks like in that system. Um, I'll show you a record that a researcher did for us, and this is this is one of the template ones for um, our Edgar data set. Um, I'm not a librarian, I am an IT person, so when it comes to a, a, a scientific judgment of what makes good metadata or what doesn't, I guess my training has been through um, submitting things to ANS and having the wonderful checkers at ANS send back pages of comments to let me know where I could have been better. Um, so uh, <laughs> I don't know that I have, I, I definitely don't have a librarian's eye for this sort of thing. Um, so I guess it's up to other people's um, judgment as to what is good metadata and what is not. I look at this and I think I can read the first one and have some understanding of uh, what it's about. Um, there's some information that comes next with links to sites to, to refer on to for someone who wants more detailed technical information. Gives me some information about what I'm going to get if I actually click on the download file up the top. Um, it, it, looks, it looks good to me. There was a little bit of back and forth with this researcher but not very much. Um, uh, 
so that was that was good. Um, I guess my attitude is if the metadata record's not out there, no one's going to find the data set. So I'd, I, I don't know how Anne's feels about the statement I'm about to make, but I'd rather a mediocre data record available for someone to have a chance at finding than to have a metadata record stuck in a review queue for six months while it's made to be perfect. Um, so I don't know, I may get burned at the stake for that comment, but um, <laughs> That, that's 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 how I feel about it, and that's how my boss feels about it. The other thing we feel that will happen is, if the records go out there and people are interested in your data set and they find it and they don't think your metadata is up to scratch, the researcher is going to be fielding lots of comments about what does this mean, what does that mean, how do I use this, and I think it wouldn't be too long before the researcher with those data sets will um, uh, learn to be. be better about the way they put their data sets together. Does that answer the question? It, yes, I think it does, but I'm sure there'll be more about quality control and um, Yes, and we were always, mediation. Yeah, we're always careful to have a mediation step on it. We never ever take a researcher's re uh, record and go straight to published. It always gets checked. What we're trying to save on is the bulk of the work of city. Well, for starters, for chasing the researcher down, um, we still do some of that. But um, because the researchers have the ability to self de uh, deposit, they self identify. So that saves um, some of the workload. We do workshops with um, the graduate research school to early career researchers and with um, PhDs. It's part of their research training program, so they know all of. So they all know about their uh, obligations around data management and about the tools that we have here to help and who they should contact if they want to create a metadata record and want their hand held for the first time. Uh, we're happy to do that. Um, Marianne, who, who does the checking? Uh, in the early stages, I was doing the checking because I've been the one through that had gone through seeding the commons and had been um, trained by um, trial by fire. Um, we now have a digital creation curation librarian um, at JCU um, starting to check now as well in in uh, in Redbox, and uh, she's working on uh, a checklist of of things to like. I because I've done a lot of the checking, I have a checklist in my head of what I look for when I'm going through metadata records. Or can I understand? Uh, the brief description, because I should be able to understand the brief description, even though I might not be up to scratch on what's in the full description. Um, do the four codes make sense? Do, you know, is the title descriptive? Is there a note there that tells me what's in the data sets so that I know what I'm getting before I click on a link? Because there's nothing scarier than clicking on a link and finding out you've just got a five terabyte download that you're not going to be able to fit on your on your file system. Um, so there's some things that I've, I've just been doing uh, myself. Uh, jo now is going through that in a much more systematic way um, because she's used to doing that in the library of making notes about making sure titles are in, um, uh, you know, uh, title case and uh, and possibly some of the more detailed formatting issues which I possibly wasn't as as fussy on. Um, so uh, that will become um, uh, a more robust system in that. Uh, we'll have a guide then for other checkers so that it will be possible for more than just you know one or two people who've been specifically trained over a period of time um, to be able to get in and do the checking. Okay. Um, the next aspect of what we were doing was uh, around the bulk imports. Um, and as I said, we've got the two uh, big app projects, Edgar and Climas, which are producing lots of data sets for us. So our, our approach to that was to get the researcher to handcraft a metadata record for a sample output from the system. So in the case of Edgar, uh, each bird species in Edgar produces results in the output of two data sets, one for a cleaned uh, set of um, observation records and then another data set which is the output of the modeling process which predicts, uh, pre uh, 
outputs the projected future distribution of that bird under different climate change scenarios and, and pr different parameters. So rather than saying write us a template, we said pick em here we go, here's an emu, right, could you write me a metadata record for the input and the output records for, for an emu. And then as a double check, we got them to do one more, which was um, the cassowary, and um, compared them and just made, and looked for where the, the strong similarities were and uh, came up with a um, template metadata record from that. Uh, with Climaz, similar process. Climaz is uh, comprised of three tools, so each tool puts out a different type of record and the output from one tool is sort of an input to, to the next tool. So, um, so again, we've got our researcher and it's the same researcher involved in the, both of these projects, so I guess we're spoiled in a way in that they've sort of been trained in metadata as they've gone along um, uh, to produce um, those three um, records, sample records. We then, because we were in an assess assessment stage with ANS, we sent them to ANS to have um, outside um, expert opinion on, on what the what they thought of the metadata, took on board the feedback that we got back um, to then develop our template. And um, in developing that template, we came up with the fields that were common to to all all the records and which fields would be um, different on a per per case basis and uh, in what we do is we make a default metadata file and then we have an override metadata file that the application writes out into the directory with the um, with the with the data set and it only has to write out that information that is particular to that record. Um, so minimal impost on the um, on the application writer. They just have to put out a small JSON file with some additional information, which is stuff that they have because it's stuff that they've either uh, in this project they've needed to display on the on the website, like the name of the bird or um, uh, some cross-referencing links to data sources and stuff, which is uh, all stored with those with those bird data. Um, that um, that uh, metadata.json file, the default file, um, sits in with the um, on the red box sits down with with the harvesting script, and the override metadata sits on the on the system where the actual data sets are being stored, and we have red box set up with a housekeeping job to run at 6 a.m. every morning, and it inspects the file system for the creation of new files. If if it finds new files, it then runs its um, create new record mechanism where it takes its default metadata file, applies the override file and then maps that to the internal uh, red box structure and thus we have a record. Because the template metadata file has gone through a series of checks before it's been put in place, uh, those new records that are created in red box go straight to published. The metadata has already been through an extensive vetting process um, and so more checking seems like overkill plus um, I cried at the thought of having to look and manually publish uh, 1,498 uh, records for Edgar, so that, that just wasn't happening. Um, as, as the project goes on, obviously new bird species don't um, come up all that frequently, so the ongoing load from Edgar, new records coming in, um, will not be as great and so that would make it more feasible to do um, manual checking if for some reason you had doubts about your system and, and wanted human eyes across records before um, before it went to um, out publicly. But that's that's all, um, you, you can fig configure that in your harvester. So if you decide to do a bulk import but um, are still cautious and want to have a um, someone look at stuff before it goes public. It's just a matter of making some changes to that, um, to the files so that it ends up in one of the review stages rather than going straight to published. 
Uh, for anyone that's interested in the bulk imports um, and want to, or you just want to have a look at what a uh, metadata template looks like, um, the EGA template can be found on our GitHub site and the uh, links there. And for those technically inclined, if you want to have a look at the rule mapping file, is can be found there. Um, uh, we, we, as I said, we successfully published the EGGA records, we had to make um, a change to the red box curation mechanism for it to cope with the request to curate that many records against a single researcher in one hit. Um, Duncan and uh, we've uh, pushed those changes that we've made back to the red box community for them to look at and Duncan said once they've um, got this um, 1.6 release out the door. They'll be looking at the change if we've made and um, more than likely um, incorporating that into the main trunk of the red box build. Possibly with some changes they may identify things that um, might cause problems in certain circumstances. Um, so that'll go through a review process. But I know there was um, possibly a other people that are going to be in similar situations where you've got a historical collection um, where the data is very, very, the metadata will be very similar across all the records um, and um, this mechanism of doing this bulk import might um, be uh, uh, something other people might want to um, want to use. Um, so that's it, that's where I got to. Um, so thanks this funding of course, ANS and also QCIF which is a, a Queensland um, sort of, um, e-research main body uh, for their assistance in getting this done. Any questions? Okay, Marianne it's probably a good opportunity for me to put an unashamed plug in at the moment for a couple of videos that we've made um, about the EDGAR project, um, particularly uh, there's one that went up yesterday or was released yesterday um, with Stephen Garnett talking about some of the moral and philosophical issues that arise when you start to look at moving birds into a better habitat. Uh, all of these things, the modelling has come out of the Edgar project. It's really, I find it fascinating. 